Sessions Chef and the Microsoft ecosystem. So if the word Chef or the word Microsoft scare the heck out of you, then uh, you're welcome to leave. <laughs> Uh, I'm Stuart Preston. I work as a principal engineer at Chef in our product engineering team. Uh, when I submitted this short talk, I didn't uh, think it would be anywhere other than a small room up on the third floor. Uh, so this is just a short uh, session really to describe what we've been doing in the Microsoft space over the last year or so. Uh, maybe show uh, some of you what we've been uh, doing, maybe something uh, new you will find uh, in what we've been doing. I'm just going to have a look at the overall sort of Microsoft ecosystem as it relates to Chef, uh, and then combine the rest of the session into a look back at 2018 and kind of what we're doing in uh, going forward into 2019 and sort of my predictions. And along the way, you can ask me anything or wait till the end or over a beer, whatever. Uh, first of all, sort of a community update by the numbers. This is my fourth year of talking at Config Management Camp. And every year um, we present some community stats and I like to present these community stats because we basically grew uh, just on the only metric that we know, which is contributors who come and talk to us in our uh, community forum on the community Slack. We've grown that by basically uh, twice the number of users there were last year. And that in turn was uh, you know, significant, significantly increased on the year before. So thank you if you uh, helped contribute to that. Let's remind ourselves what we mean when uh, we talk about sort of the ecosystem. Uh, so this is the kind of classic Chef portfolio. Uh, you know, Chef with the sort of classic infrastructure automation and sort of config management tooling on the left, the compliance tooling in the middle, and, and I've seen uh, another great session today on uh, Inspect, that was great. Uh, Habitat on the right, which is kind of more where uh, Chef as a company is kind of pivoting towards, um, and that's more into the application automation space. Talking about the Microsoft ecosystem as it relates to that, people used to come to me and say, oh, you're the Windows guy, you do Chef and Windows, and Yes, to some degree. I think that probably has proved out to be true in the last sort of a uh, couple of years that I've worked at Chef. But really, Microsoft ecosystem is everything we do with Windows, um, the Azure integrations we have, so things like test kitchen drivers for Azure, if you're familiar with test kitchen tooling. Uh, we put the Chef clients inside, inside Azure and package it up neatly so that Microsoft can put it onto thousands of VMs at once. And we've got integrations with Azure DevOps uh, so formerly Visual Studio Team Services, before that was TFS Online, and if you're old enough to uh, be in the industry like that. Looking at that sort of traditional configuration management piece, the sort of history on, on Windows is that we've had a, a body of contributors and chef employees who have built uh, cookbooks in, in the Windows space. And they've contributed those to uh, Chef's public uh, supermarket. So we've got chocolatey cookbook, a Windows cookbook, we've got PowerShell cookbooks, we've got cookbooks for um, IIS. And I think now what we're trying to do is uh, help draw that line between what is traditional configuration management and fleet management for, uh, for servers versus the kind of application app uh, automation around IIS and uh, .NET and uh, application cookbooks that people have been contributing um, <laughs> over the years. And really the direction from that, that Chef's trying to take is that if you're building an application that's dependent on IIS, you'd use our Habitat tooling for that. And the traditional configuration management with uh, uh, Chocolatey and Windows and PowerShell and other uh, what I would call sort of system-wide cookbooks uh, stays in the supermarket <laughs> ecosystem. And zero is actually the number of staff within Chef who have created any new cookbooks in the Windows space in the last kind of couple of years. <laughs> uh, we have really 
um, focused in on this bringing the value from the cookbooks that have uh, been contributed by our contributors and bringing that value into the chef client itself because frankly having having the cookbooks out there in the on the public side we don't recommend if we went into a customer and said you need to do this thing with the windows cookbook we actually don't mean you should refer to the windows cookbook that's on the uh, supermarket we want you to customize that windows cookbook and uh, for your organization and so in, instead of having those uh, those cookbooks we're now more focused on getting the resources from those cookbooks into chef clients and that's just been a something that's that's been happening over the last sort of year or two really so we say uh, with chef on windows that it's sort of a more batteries included model now so we already had uh, PowerShell script resources, resources for accessing PowerShell DSC, whether you're using PowerShell 4 or PowerShell 5, and a handful of Windows resources. Uh, and then last year, we kind of stepped on the, on the gas, and we added uh, all of these resources between the time I last spoke to you <laughs> uh, and now. So, you know, this, that's a huge number of resources that we've pulled in that have been user contributed. I just want to say that I haven't written any of those. Uh, there no chef employee, I believe, has written any of those. We've actually pulled them all in from the, from the cookbooks that were on the supermarket, uh, which is a you know, really great thing. So looking forward to sort of Chef 15. I said I was going to mix it up about over the year. We are... Uh, have some cookbooks in what we call sort of incubation at the moment. Um, we've pulled out the resources so people can actually test these. So there's a, uh, we've got a UAC resources so people can go and test the configuration of uh, a user access control uh, on Windows and go and configure that accordingly. Which we found one, that was a very popular uh, use case for people when they first wanted to sort of get started. We also uh, have now a Windows DNS resource. So for people who have a uh, managing a Windows DNS server, which is, I think, fair to say, quite a small minority of people. But we're very grateful for this contribution, uh, which came, again, from the community. You can now say, uh, you can specify a Windows uh, DNS zone and multiple Windows DNS records, and they will accumulate up and get applied to your uh, Windows DNS server. And we're also adding Windows uh, DFS, uh, so distributed file system uh, support through uh, the DFS namespace and DFS folder uh, resources. So moving on from resources, um, we have some what we call mix-ins in Ruby uh, and this this one has been around for a long time. So PowerShell Out has been a, around for a, for a long time. And the bad thing about PowerShell Out is that it, it basically is a wrapper around executing PowerShell and taking the output. And so the output from this looks like looks like this usually. <laughs> this is what you get if you run uh, PowerShell Out and just uh, get the standard out. And actually, what people need to do with that is usually, oh, I want the display name uh, of this uh, returned to me so that I can use it elsewhere in my recipe or another, or another field. So uh, was about this time last year, I added uh, PowerShell exec. And PowerShell exec doesn't have quite so many limitations as PowerShell out in the sense that PowerShell out is... Uh, going to the, uh, uh, it writes a power, temporary PowerShell script uh, into the file system and then executes it through PowerShell.exe. PowerShell.exec uses uh, a wrapper around the .NET runtime, uh, and we create a run space that has PowerShell uh, inside it. And we found that by wrapping the uh, the run space for, via this uh, .NET wrapper that we wrote the uh, invocation time kind of came down dramatically. So 
over like 100 runs of uh, PowerShell execs. It was set something like seven times faster. And the, the, the difference with PowerShell exec and PowerShell out is that the result gives you a Ruby hash that you can then go and uh, interrogate. So we can just uh, get our uh, display name. In fact, if I flip out from this, I can sort of show you uh, the difference. So this is Chef Shell. If you're used to uh, debugging uh, your Chef recipe on uh, on any platform, Chef Shell is a great tool for uh, for doing that. And, uh, very uh, often underused uh, tool, I would say. Uh, if I do PowerShell out, and let's say I want the PS version table. Uh, oh, first of all, I need to be in the right mode. Then we get this object returned to us in Ruby that looks like uh, what we call a shell out, mixlib shell out object, which has the behaviors as if I'd shelled out to something and I had an error code returned and it tracks standard error and standard out and that's about it. So we have, so we can do this to get the, the standard out from the PS version table and it looks horrible and if you want to parse that and use that information somewhere, uh, then it's pretty tricky. So now what we've got instead is, if I say PowerShell exec, PS version table, then actually we get uh, an object, and the object contains uh, the result and uh, also uh, any errors uh, that, that came back. So if I um, had, you know, if I did some horrible thing in PowerShell, that the error list that comes, comes back actually has the exception in. And previously, it was like really difficult to do things with that, that exception. PowerShell exec will make sure that you can uh, access those errors uh, every time. You can test errors.counts and so on and so on. So what else? Uh, might you have missed in the last year that we uh, added. So resources can have descriptions uh, and additional metadata, so being able to mark them as deprecated. And um, we needed this primarily for our docs uh, system, so now we are able to identify which resource actually goes with uh, which version of our documentation. Previously, it was really hard to keep the two in sync. We just assumed that the latest uh, resources that we that we had were the ones to be document to, to be documented, and now we're able to sort of filter those uh, correctly. We added a tool called Chef Resource Inspector, which is very very sort of little known. But you, if you have the Chef DK or Chef Workstation, then uh, you have Chef Resource Inspector. Uh, if I so this is. Obviously, I'm running on, on <laughs> the latest, so anything could go wrong. Uh, if I bundle exec, chef resource inspector, and pass in the name of a resource, like Windows file rule, rule, one of the ones we've added, it goes bang straight away. Look at that. That's strange. Okay, let's come out of here. Uh, what we should see is we get a, a JSON return now, which we've gone and interrogated the actual resource, and we can see the, the properties for, for the resource. They have a description. Um, we can tell you whether they're deprecated or not whether it's a default property. Uh, we've got a description at the, at the highest level. And importantly, we've got the actions. And with, with those uh, actions and the default action, we can use that. And the plan is to use that information to help build uh, the next iteration of language support for Visual Studio Code 
uh, or Atom. Uh, so if you're into your snippets and how we uh, produce the uh, descriptions today that go in those snippets, this will be the mechanism we do that in future so that there's a single uh, source of truth around that. But you can use it today as, uh, as JSON. It kind of it stops people going into the having to look around documentation. If you've got a cookbook open, it will inspect the resource inside your, uh, your cookbook if you've written a custom resource as well. Let's go back to this. All right, so here's the marketing slide, really, for um, Chef Workstation. You can see, really, the, in the, uh, how Chef software would define uh, the world. There's a bit of a maturity curve, and Chef want you to be on the right-hand side of this maturity curve. And what we identified was that there was a, uh, a gap on the left-hand side of, the, of this maturity curve where people want to do ad hoc uh, tasks, basically, on, like, let's say you've got three servers and you just want to uh, configure them using, some, using a Chef recipe you've written. Uh, and so we, as part of the Chef Workstation release, which happened uh, in the middle of the year, uh, we have a tool called Chef Run. And Chef Run uh, allows us to target uh, different uh, protocols and uh, nodes via uh, WinRM in our case, because we want Windows, uh, and there's SSH support as well there. And you can take a resource that you've that was written in uh, Chef's DSL and apply that uh, on the command line. So where we've got at the top, chocolatey package. Uh, so chocolatey package is the package manager for most of you would be familiar with on Windows. Uh, Notepad 2, action install. We can uh, take that and put it all on one command line, um, use the Chef run command to target uh, a re remote machine over WinRM. When we access the machine over WinRM, we determine whether the machine actually has a Chef client on, installed on it. And if it doesn't, we'll put a Chef client on it. Then we'll package up uh, into this thing called a policy file bundle, uh, our command to run, which is uh, essentially the, the outcome of the install, install action on chocolatey package transfer that to the remote machine, then run Chef Client with that policy file. And so by doing so, we've now introduced this ad, we're back to our ad hoc uh, mode, basically, which is uh, kind of on the left. If you, if you attend kind of Chef training or the, the learning tracks, it probably puts you in the middle. If you have our professional services, you end up sort of further on the right of this diagram. It's kind of how I like to think about it anyway. So how does this relate to the Windows um, and sort of Microsoft world? Well, probably via our work that we did with uh, Azure in the middle of the year, which was to uh, integrate the Chef Workstation tooling into Azure's Cloud Shell. And so Azure Cloud Shell is a container that is spun up for every administrative user of, the, of Azure. And you, to access it, you go to the Azure portal, and you click on the on the button uh, at the at the top right that, that you see here. And the Azure Cloud Shell is preloaded with tools like the Git uh, and the Azure CLI. Uh, it also has uh, our Chef tools available in it. Uh, if I flip out. this. So this is the Azure portal I'm talking about. And this is how you get started with Cloud Shell. You literally click the Cloud Shell button. And up comes a message asking whether you want a Bash or a PowerShell uh, style container. We'll, we'll, get, we'll take a Bash one. Once the 
Cloud Shell has started up, the browser then connects a WebSocket to, uh, to this environment so that uh, we now have a working, working terminal. I'm going to give, give version. And importantly, I've got, I've, for us, we have our Chef tools installed in here. And it's basically the same as you would get if you'd installed uh, the Chef development kit. Uh, this is slightly out of date, uh, but it's probably my <laughs> environment. The, uh, so we have a Chef development kit, we've got Test Kitchen, uh, InSpec is kind of ready uh, inside here, ready to go uh, as well. And so why, why is this kind of useful? Well, it means I can now go somewhere where I don't need any tools installed locally on my uh, development environment and actually kind of get started with those ad hoc uh, tasks especially. So one example, the next example was Chef Run uh, against a uh, Linux machine. Uh, we've got user workshop action equals create, and that's a uh, fairly natural uh, progression from from the earlier example. And you can see what that what that output looks like. I don't have a machine kind of spun up to do that with live, but uh, we have those uh, chef commands available. Now, if I'm in a cloud shell, remembering this is a container that's running in Azure's uh, container instances, then uh, let, I want to um, do, some, do some editing of, my, of, a, of a cookbook. In fact, I want to create a cookbook. And of course, the command we would teach you to do that is chef generate cookbook. And then the name of a cookbook. And we can do that live within, uh, within the cloud shell. And it will store, the, uh, store this in the the file system. The file system is mapped to uh, some Azure storage, so it, it persists kind of with you. If I CD into Config Management Camp, now I want to uh, edit my default recipe in my in my cookbook. But I mean inside a container, and uh, and the surprising sort of thing about this is I can type exactly as I as I would if I was on my local machine. Uh, code uh, dots from that from that folder, and I'm now inside that cookbook folder, inside Monaco, which is the Visual Studio Code's editor. And so I can go and navigate to my uh, my default recipe. I can actually work with this completely uh, in my browser. Everything I save is being saved to my uh, cloud drive, and I've got no local uh, files involved at all in that. Okay, let's go back. Uh, what else? Uh, so I said it was InSpec on there. What have we been doing with InSpec on Azure? So uh, mainly we achieved, uh, so Azure has a CIS uh, benchmark uh, at different levels, so level one, level two, et cetera, uh, which they make, they make public. We have a uh, content within, uh, within Chef. It's premium content that you get if you subscribe to our product uh, that allows you to verify your environment for CIS level one uh, compliance. And our interpretation of, of that was certified by, the, uh, by CIS back in uh, September. And we're working on the level two uh, benchmark. But to get to the benchmark, we, have, we had to write some, uh, some code so that we could test resources in Azure rather than just looking within VMs or containers to see the, what the state was. So we have this project. Uh, it's on GitHub um, slash inspec slash inspec Azure. And it's basically a resource pack that helps to use the REST API, Azure's REST API to provide the resources to fill out the <laughs> the, the benchmarks, and so as we, I wanted to get YAML in here somewhere. The the 
profile definition format for uh, inspec uh, is a YAML file. And all you need to do is add uh, a depends line at the bottom. Uh, and you can depend directly on uh, what's in, uh, what we've published in into master on uh, GitHub here. And then you can do things like this and say, well, OK, I've got my, my control. So instead of testing files and directories and users and groups for and permissions and, and so on on, the, on, the, on a machine, we're actually testing in a fairly abstract fashion the uh, Azure API itself. And we're looking at, in this case, we've got a description for an Azure virtual machine, uh, which exists inside the resource group called my resource group, and the name is prodweb01, and for that virtual machine, it should exist. It should have a monitoring agency installed. It should have endpoint protection installed. We've added those, uh, those helpers, basically, to, uh, to, to give you access to the underlying uh, sort of nastiness that uh, you, don't, you don't have to see. Um, Okay, so sort of just about coming to the end of the bits I had. The sort of other predictions I have for this year. Uh, I'm really hoping that we get rid of Windows 7 and 2008 support. So at the beginning of last year, I said we would get rid of 2008 support. Uh, and then there was basically a big uh, <laughs> uh, backlash, I, I suppose is the best word to call it. Uh, to say, no, we need to carry on supporting Windows 2008 until the end of its ex extended support life, uh, which happens to be January 2020. So I really hope that this year we, we can sort of draw a line under Windows 7 and Windows 2008 and get rid of that. Uh, similarly, with 32-bit installations, really want to get rid of, of all of those uh, because they would simplify uh, our build process. Uh, a heck of a lot, we would uh, spend a lot more time at actually uh, testing just on 64-bit. On uh, and there's no, hopefully by the end of the year, there'll be no supported 32-bit versions of Windows uh, uh, for you to, uh, to install anyway. As I sort of alluded to uh, earlier, policy files are kind of quite fashionable for Chef. Uh, and I think what, what we're seeing uh, with the move to where people are putting more of their application stacks into Habitat uh, is that there's a, a groundswell of support for a policy file based workflow. And that, I predict, will sort of overtake Chef, Chef Server workflow this year. Uh, it's definitely, if policy files aren't in your roadmap, I would definitely advise looking at policy files this year. Uh, I, I've put PowerShell Core 6 support, so we saw, we saw PowerShell Out, which is a mix-in, and PowerShell Exec, which is a mix-in. The resource that allows you to access that is called PowerShell Script. I am fairly confident we will add Linux and uh, PowerShell Core support to that this year. And the reason I know this is that I'm doing a conference talk about it in June <laughs> uh, in Hanover. So, um, yeah it probably be there. And yeah, maybe the end of the Windows cookbook because I'm hoping that we've extracted the value out of the Windows cookbook and put those Windows resources back into, uh, back into Core Chef. So when we release Chef 15, there will only be a very small section of used uh, resources within the Windows cookbook. Uh, and I'm sure you can expect more announcements between now and ChefConf as we come up with uh, more things there. ChefConf is in May in Seattle. Uh, so if any of you uh, are from that, that, uh, that area, we'd love to see you there, even if you're not from that area. Uh, that's it. Ask me anything. Come down. <laughs> Thank you.